journey back to the year 1990. The Super Famicom arrives in Japan along with two brand new games. The first, Super Mario World, the next installment in the already very popular Mario series. But the second, the future of Formula One, F-Zero. Delivering a real 3D perspective at a blazing fast 60 frames per second, F-Zero is an impressive visual showcase for the new 16-bit machine, and it served as one of the first games developed entirely in-house by EAD. It was a huge success, and that success ultimately led to the creation of multiple sequels across three generations of consoles, a showcase for its next generation handheld machine, and even an animated series before unceremoniously disappearing, relegated exclusively to appearances in other Nintendo games. But those that have played it know that F-Zero deserves its place in Nintendo's pantheon. This series delivers streamlined arcade-style racing with a sense of speed and style, unlike most anything else in their stable. And on this episode of DF Retro, we'll explore the series in its entirety. From its original 16-bit outing, its appearance on the Satellaview and 64DD add-ons, all the way to the stunning F-Zero GX and AX created thanks to a partnership between Sega and Nintendo. Along the way, we'll discuss the series' history, the impact it's had on players, and of course the technology behind each game. We'll also check out numerous homebrew releases and look at the best way to enjoy F-Zero on modern machines today. All this and more is coming up on this episode of DF Retro. In the world of video games, racing has always been popular in some form or another. Developers have long sought to bring the thrill of high-speed driving to both arcades and home consoles. And Nintendo was no exception. Years before the arrival of F-Zero, Nintendo had experimented with the genre on both the Famicom and NES. With such limited technology, we would see a wide range of perspectives attempted. Excitebike is one of Nintendo's earlier home racing games. Using a side-scrolling perspective, players would launch across the track on the way to the goal. Impressive use of parallax scrolling helped increase the sense of speed, but this perspective made less sense for track-based racing games with actual twists and turns. One solution to this problem is a 3D behind-the-back perspective. In the arcades, Sega had experimented with the 3D perspective in games such as 1981's Turbo. It wasn't the first attempt at this, but it was perhaps the most impressive. Namco, though, made a larger splash with Pole Position the following year, a game which received numerous conversions, especially to Atari 8-bit machines, which spawned this legendary commercial. Well, Muffy Buffy... Biff Jr. and I are going on our Sunday drive. Oh no, you're not! You're gonna play pole position! But of course, just a few weeks before the internally developed Excite Bike released on Famicom, Nintendo published another game created by Satoru Iwata and his team at HAL, known as F1 Race. Clearly inspired by the likes of Pole Position, it demonstrates what's possible on the hardware with the same 3D perspective as Pole Position. But in 1985, Nintendo released its own take on this perspective with the futuristic Mach Rider. This high-speed racing action game features a behind-the-back perspective and reasonably fluid graphics, at least for 1985. The aesthetic, character designs, and even the inclusion of a course editor in the original Famicom release all hinted things to come for the eventual F-Zero series itself. While not directly cited as an inspiration or anything, one can't help but see the similarities. But according to Kazunobu Shimizu, the director of F-Zero, it was actually 1987's Famicom Grand Prix F1 Race for the Famicom Disk System 
not directly inspired F-Zero itself. While the game utilizes a top-down perspective, the basic course layouts, the core game design, and things like the pit stops all kind of resemble what F-Zero would become, at least in an abstract sense. Nintendo of America, though, at the time criticized the game, suggesting it wasn't cool enough for the US audience. Shimizu took this to heart, and that would help fuel his desire to make something cooler with F-Zero. Before F-Zero, though, he also worked as a designer on Famicom Grand Prix 2, 3D Hot Rally. This is a completely different game, though, than F1 Race, but it shifted to this pseudo 3D behind-the-back perspective that we saw with pole position and the like. I believe that these two games combined, along with the criticism from Nintendo of America, sort of helped form the basis of what F-Zero would become. F-Zero finally arrived in Japan, alongside the Super Famicom in 1990, and would also appear again as a launch title in each territory. From the outside, F-Zero makes a strong first impression. It delivers a sense of speed and perspective that wasn't really common in the console space at the time. It gave you this feeling of speeding through a 3D track environment, and it did so at a sustained 60 frames per second. Now, whether you knew anything about frame rate or not didn't matter. It was clear that F-Zero was very smooth. But beyond that, following the critique of Famicom Grand Prix, perhaps, it's clear that the team wanted to ensure that F-Zero would be appealing to gamers around the world. They wanted it to have this certain cool factor. To that end, Nintendo took steps to ensure that consumers in North America and Europe would feel a certain sense of familiarity. The setting combines elements of popular movies at the time, such as Tron, Mad Max, Cannonball Run, and the cult classic Roger Corman-produced Death Race, to create a world full of scum, villainy, and bombastic heroes. When you open the manual for the game, you'll even find a comic book that introduces the world of F-Zero in greater detail and takes further inspiration from the likes of 2000 AD's Judge Dredd, another character who shares quite a bit in common with F-Zero's Captain Falcon. And speaking of Falcon, according to the game's graphic designer, Takuya Imamura, Captain Falcon actually started life as a potential mascot for the Super Famicom console itself, complete with colors corresponding to the controller's buttons. Of course, Captain Falcon has instead become synonymous with F-Zero, and you can check out his adventures in the aforementioned manual, which is presented in full color. The comic was done by the team at Valiant Comics, Jim Shooter, Art Nichols, and Bob Layton, who had previously worked on several other comics based on Nintendo properties. Strangely, the box art used for Japan and the US differs greatly, as Japan's box actually makes extensive use of Valiant's artwork to give it that Western pulp comic vibe, whereas the actual Western box art uses a more generic looking illustration. These themes would become increasingly central to the series with new installments, but even during the early period, it did have a unique flavor for a Nintendo-developed game. Of course, Captain Falcon and crew really only became a part of those games with the second real entry in the series. The Super NES original is really all about racing, and this is where F-Zero shines. The most critical piece of innovation, and perhaps its primary reason for existing in the first place, stems from a little thing called Mode 7. If you were playing Super NES during this era, you've no doubt heard the term, and as a launch title, F-Zero would be one of the first games to make extensive use of this feature. But what exactly is Mode 7? Well, to put it simply, this refers to a specific display mode available on Super NES hardware, which allows developers to perform an affine transformation on a background layer plane. It basically means you can scale and rotate a tile map around, giving the impression of a 3D texture mapped surface. Now, when creating games for the platform, developers have access to eight specific modes, which offer various combinations of displaying background layers and sprites with various limitations. Some run in a higher resolution, but with fewer colors. Others allow more unique layers of parallax, 
but Mode 7 is specifically designed to allow this 3D transformation in real time. F-Zero then works by simply rotating this pseudo 3D plane around the player vehicle. The tile map has various properties that can be assigned for collision or hazards as well. The screen itself is primarily composed of three background layers. As a base, you have the Mode 7 tile map itself, but upwards along the horizon line, additional background elements are drawn into this layer. This is then parallaxed against the second background layer, which features the clouds and other detail. Then, there's the sprite layer, featuring certain dynamic HUD elements as well, of course, as the vehicles themselves. The maximum size for a Mode 7 tile map, then, is 1024 by 1024 pixels, and this is what was used to make the actual racetrack. It really is just a flat surface rotating around a fixed point, basically the player car. But it's effective and lends the game a real sense of depth at a smooth frame rate. Other races then are handled as multiple sprites which are swapped in and out to give the illusion of 3D depth based on their distance from the camera. This may all seem trivial today, but if you look at the console landscape during this period, there really wasn't anything else remotely comparable in the home. In that sense, Nintendo did achieve its goal of creating a technical showpiece to show off the Super NES. But of course, there's a lot more to F-Zero than its visuals. The core game design is also a lot of fun. Yeah, it's light on content and relatively simple, but what's here is expertly crafted and still fun today. Now when you go back to Famicom Grand Prix, the game that inspired F-Zero, it's a very simple game. You kind of just tap left and right to adjust your position while driving around the track. F-Zero in comparison tries to bring its own brand of physics, if you will. You'll need to use the air brakes to navigate sharp turns, and you have proper momentum rather than just sticking to the ground. Beyond that, you can even take to the air via jumps, which feels great but the trackside collision is not active while airborne, meaning you can actually crash outside the map. This aspect combined with the high speed makes for an engaging arcade racer. When you factor in the track hazards and more challenging layouts, it's a game that really rewards mastery. It feels great to learn. You have several cups then to race while vying for the top spot, but unfortunately, this is where its launch game roots kinda shows, as its content is relatively sparse. There is no two-player option here, nor anything beyond the Grand Prix and practice modes. Of course, one of the key features of any racing game is the soundtrack, and F-Zero absolutely excels in this area with a multitude of memorable tracks. So, F-Zero was a success, but fans would not get a direct sequel until many years later. But if you were an owner of the Satellaview add-on for Super Famicom in Japan, there was more F-Zero goodness waiting for you. BS F -Down Grand Prix 2. The Satellaview allowed players to connect their Super Famicom to this add-on device, a modem that brought players to a central hub, much like the one found in games such as Mother 2. And from here, events and purchasable items could be enjoyed. Across four weeks of broadcasts, starting on December 29th, 1996, and ending on January 24th, 97, BS F-Zero Grand Prix brought players four stages per broadcast, which was accompanied by live commentary from famed narrator and voice talent, Bucky Koba. F-Zero Grand Prix Night League! Round one! whom audiences would have been familiar with from real-life sporting events and television series such as as well as Tsutomu Tareki and Seiichi Hira, who along with Koba were well known for their announcing. BS F-Zero Grand Prix featured all new vehicle designs and stage layouts, which in addition to the commentary also have broadcasted music from various sources, including David Lee Roth, Yes, and even the official Jazz Arrange album CD for F-Zero, arranged by Michiko and Richard Hill. 
The broadcast was deemed successful enough that Nintendo quickly announced that there would be another event in the summer of 97, with practice runs opening up on June 1st. This event saw the introduction of several new announcers, including winners from the previous events to help commentate alongside the returning Bucky Koba. Grand Prix 2 was sold on the promise of being the ultimate challenge of F-Zero, and with the additional practice time would promise to be the greatest challenge fans would experience. Indeed, the new tracks, including the long-lost Metal Fort, proved to be one of the heftiest challenges indeed. The success of BS F-Zero Grand Prix in Japan even had Nintendo option a release featuring all new track layouts and cartridge in the West, as stated in Nintendo Power. That would have seen the game released in, say, late 97 to early 98 on the now retired 16 bit machine, but alas, it was not to be. So, with the nature of these Satellaview releases being broadcast events, you'd think that this was yet another Nintendo legend lost to time. Well, thankfully, that's not the case. Thanks to the ever helpful Japanese gaming preservationist, Kukun Kun. Nearly all original broadcasts have been digitized and uploaded to the internet, allowing us to experience the whole event in decent quality even for today, giving us a chance to see Metal Fort in action as well as hearing the commentary that goes along with it. Furthermore, the practice stages from Grand Prix 2 were downloadable, and thanks to folks saving the tracks onto their Satellaview memory card units, most of the stages have been preserved and can be played via emulation or EverDrives. It's a neat curiosity then, and quite forward thinking to see that already by 1997, Nintendo brought community-based commentary and challenge via the internet to the Super Famicom, not to mention what could essentially be considered an early form of DLC, keeping F-Zero, one of their first releases on the console, alive and updated to be among their very last efforts on the same console. And the idea of additional stage creation and community efforts would become central to F-Zero in the future. But for now, let's move on to that future. Aside from BS F-Zero Grand Prix, released for a very specific Japanese audience, all was quiet on the futuristic racing side of Nintendo for years to come. Nintendo did experiment with a potential sequel featuring two-player split-screen, and according to Hideki Kono, these were experiments that ultimately resulted in the origin point for Super Mario Kart, which would become Nintendo's prime racing franchise going forward. Meanwhile, the competition was heating up, and futuristic racing games were becoming somewhat more commonplace. Games like Crystal Dynamics Crash and Burn, which showcased these remarkable visuals for the time. In 1995, though, brand new consoles from Sony and Sega had entered the market, bringing an influx of new, futuristic racing games along with them. Wipeout from Psygnosis was perhaps the most important, with a focus on creating these huge 3D spaces with massive swooping track designs, paired with that UK club aesthetic and dance music of the mid-90s. It plays different than F-Zero, but it fills that void nicely, and it had that cool factor that Nintendo had originally striven for. Sega also published a game known as Cyber Speedway, or Grand Chaser in Japan for the Sega Saturn, which was less successful, but a still interesting game. There were other titles as well, such as High Octane or Slipstream 5000 on the PC that all had similar themes. Nintendo is still in development Project Reality then, which would become the Nintendo 64, was even teased with a silicon graphics rendered demo featuring a futuristic racing sequence. When the system did finally launch, however, the first Nintendo produced racer was a pseudo-sequel to the 1992 Game Boy game Wave Race, 
rather than a new F-Zero title. I'm talking about Wave Race 64, of course. It's likely that Nintendo applied the same thinking to its creation of this game as the original F-Zero. They wanted a racing game that showcases the system's capabilities, in this case, an actual wave simulation. Unfortunately, while the game is beautiful and fun, it runs at just 20 frames per second, so it feels rather slow compared to something like F-Zero, and F-Zero itself was unfortunately nowhere to be seen. Thankfully, Nintendo did have an idea of how to bring the series back, and Miyamoto himself teased the existence of F-Zero 64, a new game designed from the ground up for its 64-bit machine. Key staff that had worked on Wave Race 64 then would be involved in the creation of this new title. When it was finally revealed at Nintendo's Space World show in 97, the name was revealed along with a bold new claim. This new F-Zero game would deliver full 3D graphics with up to 30 racers at a smooth 60 frames per second, and it would be known as F-Zero X. When looking at F-Zero X, it's important to remember that with the shift of 3D graphics, higher frame rates became a lot less common, especially on N64, where titles typically delivered between, say, 15 and 30 FPS on average. This would not be acceptable for an F-Zero game, thus the decision was made to target a full 60 frames per second, just like the original game on Super NES. And EAD managed to achieve this goal. F-Zero X does indeed run at a full 60 frames per second and stands as one of the most fluid titles ever released for the system. But performance like this doesn't come free, so what was sacrificed to reach this goal? Well, primarily, Nintendo keeps the visuals relatively simple while still retaining the visual signature the series is known for. The abstract backgrounds and deep sky gradients are still there. It's still an atmospheric looking world. But aside from the odd building placed along the track, most of the stages just involve floating chunks of track suspended above the ground. This keeps the overall world geometry at a very low level, which also improves overall performance. Beyond this, texture usage is kept to a minimum. There's just enough variety here to keep the track visually interesting. I do love the way these fast clouds though are handled above the track. Now vehicles then are also handled rather smartly. Most use very little in the way of actual texture maps, instead relying almost entirely on smooth shaded polygons, giving them a rather clean look. The game makes use of multiple LODs, allowing distant vehicles to use as few polygons as possible. In this case, I think keeping the vehicle models relatively simplistic means that they've actually aged rather gracefully. Once you begin playing though, it's clear that there's a lot more to this than just visuals. The physics and speed of everything is hugely impressive given the time of release, and the track design itself has changed in some significant ways since the original. For starters, F-Zero X introduces the boost mechanic, and specifically a boost delay feature. Essentially, you have access to an onboard boost function during the race that you can trigger with a button, but it only becomes active after you complete the first lap. This also happens to drain your ship's health, or shield, which you need to survive, and that can still be refilled just like the original F-Zero, so there's now actually more of a gameplay purpose to it this time. The boost delay feature then really gives you one lap to basically learn the track before you're fully unleashed and go all out with boosting. The tracks themselves also feature a much wider range of structures, the original, of course, features flat tracks due to its reliance on Mode 7, but with F-Zero X, the full 3D nature of the game allows for some major changes to its underlying design. There's now massive loops, huge elevation changes with sweeping curves, pipes, half pipes, and even tubes that you can race around on. These segments can be combined together to create some truly wild tracks. When you fire the game up in single player mode, you have three cups available initially with two additional unlockable cups, the Joker Cup and of course the X Cup. The X Cup itself is rather interesting as this features random track generation. 
Now, the tracks themselves are kept relatively simple. There's no tunnels or loops or anything quite like that, but it's a nice way to add replayability to the game. There's also a new death race mode, which basically has you going around a track while slamming into racers, attempting to knock them off the track or destroy them. Aesthetically, F-Zero X also leans more into the comic book inspirations of the original game. While Captain Falcon and crew were visible within the manual, they didn't really have much of a presence in the actual game. This time, however, that changes. Firstly, there's loads of unlockable vehicles now, and each vehicle is accompanied by artwork representing the character driving it. So you get a better sense of the different characters throughout this world. Each vehicle then has its own statistics divided between body, boost, and grip, while X introduces the option to favor acceleration versus maximum speed with a slider, something we'll see in a future game as well. But of course, while the single player component is excellent, F-Zero X also introduces full-on split-screen multiplayer to the mix, just as Nintendo had envisioned before developing Super Mario Kart. This means up to four players can share a single screen, and perhaps most impressively, it retains 60 frames per second even when using this mode. So you have a fully fleshed out multiplayer mode in addition to all the single player cups. And one of the secrets to the game's success lies in the fact that each track is actually relatively short. Each lap takes under a minute on average, and often much less than that, so even if you do go flying off the track, it's very quick to retry and get back into the action. It's a very addictive and fun game. Now, in terms of audio, F-Zero X leans more into guitar-heavy tracks that sound absolutely excellent. In the original N64 release, though, all tracks are played back in mono, unfortunately, but the music itself is of very high quality for the system. Take a listen. It was so good, in fact, that a guitar arrangement album was released the year following the game's initial arrival on the system. And that sounds great, too. So yeah, F-Zero X, it's packed with content and modes, making it a fully featured racing game with beautiful visuals and superb control. While relatively basic in appearance, it's actually one of the more impressive games released on N64 to it, due to its high frame rate and clean visuals. At this point, it really felt like the series was on the fast track to becoming a Nintendo internally developed staple. But F-Zero X did not end here. For Japanese owners, there was an expansion released just two years after that original game known as the F-Zero X Expansion Kit. Now, this is a special release in that it was produced for the very short-lived N64 DD, or disk drive. This was basically an add-on device for the system that had been promised for years, but it arrived very late in 1999 and received very few games. This format uses magnetic disks that can hold up to 64 megabytes, which ironically is the same as some of the system's larger games stored on carts, such as Resident Evil 2. It requires the use of the original F-Zero X cartridge, though, alongside the disk, but when combined, you get a lot of new features. Firstly, if you just want to race, you basically gain two new challenging cups, DD1 and DD2 along with both a vehicle and track editor. This time it also includes actual stereo music tracks due to the additional space on the disc, though the original mono tracks are still available as well. All of the original features are accessible when using the expansion kit, making this basically the complete version of the game. 
Now, the new cups are a nice touch, adding 12 excellent new tracks to the mix. They're more challenging than what's included in the original game though, and they do a nice job of expanding the overall selection. But the key feature here is, of course, the track editor. This ambitious option allows users to craft a full F-Zero circuit using all of the various parts featured in the already available pre-created tracks. The interface itself is a little cumbersome to be fair, but it's reasonably functional and rather impressive given the release date. You basically start out with this grid. You place points on the grid, which then define the basic layout of the track. From there, you can modify the points and select the different sections between each point. From there, you can choose the different types of track you want, whether it's a flat track or a half pipe or a tube or anything else like that. It's all there. It's also possible to place some additional scenery, such as buildings, change the surrounding scenery, and select a music track. You can even save your tracks then and play them within a custom cup available in this version of the game. Then on top of that, there's the vehicle creation option, which is perhaps less exciting, but still interesting. It allows you to assemble various parts and assign performance values to your custom vehicle. You're basically presented with a large screen full of different parts, and you combine them with other parts to create your dream vehicle, though none of them quite look as cool as I might like. But this is a feature we'd see return in the future, so keep this in mind. Now of course, the 64DD is a very rare and expensive piece of hardware, so it's not exactly easy to get your hands on this original set. But if you have access to something like an EverDrive, this along with other 64DD games have all been converted to large ROM files, allowing you to run them on a regular 64 console. It does require the RAM expansion pack, of course. With this, however, we've arrived at the end of EAD's direct development of F-Zero games. It may have seemed like the future was bright, and technically it still is, but the rest of the games we'll be discussing today then were primarily developed by third-party partners such as Sega or ND Cube, among others. But each of EAD's original titles would serve as an inspiration for what would come next. The year was 2001, Dreamcast had come and gone, PlayStation 2 was a huge hit, and both GameCube and Xbox were on the horizon. But if you were looking for something slightly more portable, Nintendo had its next generation handheld machine waiting for you. Yes, I'm talking about the Game Boy Advance, Nintendo's ARM-based 32-bit handheld machine which arrived in the year 2001 alongside a range of new games. Some of these games were conversions of existing Super NES titles, while others were completely new creations. F-Zero itself lands somewhere in the middle with F-Zero Maximum Velocity from ND Cube and Nintendo. Much like the original game, Maximum Velocity feels like a title crafted to showcase what was possible on the new console. After all, this was a small handheld device and it could now comfortably deliver experiences on par with those seen on Super NES, a very impressive feat for the time. In developing F-Zero, Kazunobu Shimizu, one of the key figures responsible for the original game, returned to work with ND Cube to bring the series back yet again. So what does this mean for the game itself? Well, at its core, ND Cube closely modeled this game after the original Super NES title. It still runs at 60 frames per second, and they're using a GBA equivalent to Mode 7, allowing full scaling and rotation of the playfield. This time, however, there's this parallax effect between the road and the surroundings, increasing the overall sense of depth. That said, while it does look great, the horizon seems to cut off slightly earlier than that on Super NES, making it more difficult to see what's ahead of you. The playfield also uses more detailed tile work and an expanded color palette rather than simple colors used throughout most, but not all of the track in the original game. I actually prefer the Super NES track design myself, but your mileage may vary. The vehicles, however, are undeniably a big step down using these ugly pre-rendered sprites with awkward looking shapes. Taken together, the game looks pretty good on a portable screen, but 
some of the design choices result in a less visually appealing game. Of course, seeing a Mode 7 style effect like this running so smoothly on a portable system circa 2001 was very impressive indeed. I feel similarly about the game design choices as well. It features a Grand Prix and training mode like the original, as well as a single and multi-pack link play option, which is a nice bonus. In Grand Prix, you have the typical league selection, and then you're dropped into a race. Immediately, it's clear that the racing itself has changed significantly from the original. Vehicles inherently slide around the track like an air hockey puck, which honestly makes some sense, but I found it more difficult to navigate turns while maintaining speed. The vehicles all wind up feeling noticeably different as well, and the only default vehicle I found usable is the hideously ugly JB Crystal, though there are other unlockables as well. Maximum Velocity also takes a sharp turn when it comes to soundtrack composition with a brand new selection of tunes. The compositions themselves are rather catchy, but the playback quality is scratchy and relatively tinny, as was common on the Game Boy Advance. Ultimately, Maximum Velocity is a good game, but it both holds perhaps too true to the original F-Zero, lacking any sort of real surprise in its track design, and feels less satisfying to play overall. It is worth noting that this would be one of ND Cube's very first games, but also their only F-Zero title. But while the decision to partner up with other developers was only partially successful this time, their next outing would stand as perhaps the best in the series. When Nintendo GameCube first arrived in September 2001 in Japan, it launched with three games, Luigi Mansion, Wave Race Blue Storm, and Super Monkey Ball from Sega. Developed internally by Sega's Amusement Vision, Super Monkey Ball was one of the stars of the early GameCube lineup, and Nintendo took notice. Amusement Vision would join Nintendo to create the next installment in the F-Zero franchise for their new system, and it would be called F-Zero GX and F-Zero AX? Revealed earlier in 2002 and then finally shown at E3 the same year, Nagoshi-san from Amusement Vision joined Miyamoto on stage to highlight their partnership with a short trailer showcasing the new vision for F-Zero. But at the end, it was revealed that there would be both a GameCube and arcade-specific version of the game released on the Triforce arcade board. This is what F-Zero AX is about. The idea, two iterations of the game that would be compatible via a GameCube memory card. You could go to the arcade and play F-Zero AX and earn credits that would then be usable at home. A neat idea, but perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself here. F-Zero GX arrived in Japan during the summer of 2003, with the international version following shortly thereafter. The result? one of the finest arcade racing games ever made. F-Zero GX is fast, it's beautiful, it's packed with content, it's 60 frames per second widescreen, and it remains just as great today as it was in 2003. At its core, the design is derived from the work done on F-Zero X on N64. It features that same delayed boost mechanic, the various track segments, including pipes and half pipes, and the same progression through the Grand Prix. But the ways in which they've improved upon the formula are significant. Nagoshi and his team at Sega were joined by Takuya Imamura from Nintendo, who had previously worked on the original two F-Zero games. They created something that feels like a perfect fusion between Nintendo and Sega, something that would have been unthinkable just a few years prior. F-Zero GX offers a wide range of modes, features, and options with a large selection of tracks. Designed exclusively for Nintendo GameCube, the controls feel extremely well suited to the controller itself. Pulling both triggers in to slide around a sharp curve feels incredible and the precise analog stick on the GameCube is flawless. 
The feeling of slicing your way through the pack while navigating the track works brilliantly here. Over the course of the game, you'll race through 26 unique circuits. Each circuit is packed with variety, from bright blue skies to rain-soaked tubes and beyond. F-Zero GX goes all out with scenery design in a way that wasn't feasible on the N64. The floating, disconnected tracks from that game have been mostly replaced with designs snaking through beautifully realized locales. From tunnel segments that have you move below the surface of the ocean, almost kind of like Scud Race, to this massive skyscraper-packed environment with huge jumps, it's a significant step up from the floating voids of F-Zero X. There's so much more variety this time around. Now, like prior games, you have access to a range of cups from the start of the game, each with a number of tracks necessary to complete. There's also two unlockable cups, the Diamond Cup and the AX Cup, which includes all of the arcade tracks. Unlocking these cups, though, is very difficult and tied to one of the new modes introduced in this game. I'm speaking, of course, of the story mode. F-Zero GX features a collection of missions, each with cutscenes and unique objectives. From racing gangs to escaping from an exploding facility to taking down a rival while dodging falling debris, each chapter attempts to mix things up as it follows Captain Falcon during his training to win the next Grand Prix. These sequences are paired with over-the-top CGI cutscenes as well, before and after each mission you have an opportunity to catch up on Falcon's wild day. Unfortunately, the cutscenes themselves are stored as low-resolution movies and are poorly scaled to fill the screen, so they don't look great. But actually seeing all of these cutscenes is a serious challenge. It just so happens that these sequences are among the most difficult you'll face in a racing game. Finishing these challenges on the hardest difficulty is a true test of skill and patience. There's plenty of challenging games that have existed since the beginning of the medium, but I feel that F-Zero GX's story mode on the hardest difficulty is one of the most challenging games you'll ever play. Seriously, there is zero room for error here. Absolute mastery is a must. Of course, there's plenty of other stuff here as well, including vehicle customization options with unlockable parts, multiplayer, and tons of characters, each with their own associated movie and theme song. But what really brings it all together is the presentation. F-Zero GX is a gorgeous game. It supports 480p output and 16x9 widescreen at a silky smooth 60 frames per second. The scale and quality of the tracks is a huge step up from anything else in the series history. It takes full advantage of the GameCube's new hardware to deliver a high level of geometric detail across every stage. The leap in power from N64 to GameCube was significant, but Sega's prowess in developing this project cannot be understated. During a normal race, you'll face off against 29 other ships. It's a 30-ship grid, just like F-Zero X, and each of these ships has received a massive bump in overall geometric and texture detail. You can clearly see the pilot, who's often very detailed, moving around as you take on the course. The effects from the vehicles themselves, such as the booster, and general weather all around the player further tie everything together. The rainstorms are especially gorgeous, as are the heat waves in the desert environment. The tracks themselves impress. The sense of scale here is immense, with swooping scenery extending far off into the distance. It's a sight to behold, and honestly, it's the best the series would ever look. What's interesting though is thanks to emulators such as Dolphin, it's actually possible to catch a glimpse of how this was achieved on the GameCube, at least the way they're managing their geometry. So by using Dolphin's free camera system, it demonstrates how the calling system works in F-Zero GX. You can see how the game aggressively calls chunks of level data in and out based on where the player car is facing. So just enough is drawn at any point to ensure minimal pop-in. Keep in mind that while using the free camera in Dolphin, all drawing is being calculated from the original intended camera perspective, so we really get to see it in action here. So yeah, this is a real technical achievement for the system. And on top of that, even with all this detail, everything is delivered without any visible loading screens, allowing for a completely seamless experience all around. I should also mention the game's soundtrack. It's vast. As I said, every single character in the game has their own theme. The story mode has unique music, as do the cutscenes, and most of the tracks. 
There's just a huge amount of music here. The bulk of the soundtrack was composed by Hidenori Shoji and Daiki Kasho, with a smattering of guests and vocalists contributing to its production. At the time, it was divisive, leaving behind the guitar riffs of the N64 game, GX is more electronic in nature, but I'm a big fan of it. Here's a sample. So yeah, F-Zero GX on GameCube, it's fantastic, but what about AX, the arcade game? Developed alongside GX, AX consists of six playable tracks in both a time trial and Grand Prix mode. The presentation is very much like the home console game, but with one major difference, the cabinet itself. This large, wheel-driven cab pulls players into the game in a way that is only possible in a game center. Unfortunately, I don't have any filmed footage of this in action, but it is a very interesting design. Now, as noted, it features a memory card slot allowing players to earn points for use with the home version of the game. The tracks themselves also offer a nice mix of the best themes featured in GX. And the design feels slightly wider in general, perhaps to ensure better playability with the steering wheel. Unfortunately, actually finding a real arcade cabinet is not the easiest task in the world in most parts of the world, but there is one solution. The ROM hacking community has released a patch which essentially allows the arcade version, which is contained within the GX files, to boot directly on a GameCube via something like, say, Swiss. This basically means you can play the arcade game at home without the need to fully unlock the AX cup from the story mode. You need an original copy of the game ISO and a patching utility to create the resulting disk image and load it up on your GameCube and you can play F-Zero AX. So yeah, the F-Zero GX and AX project was a moderate to large success. It sold roughly 1.5 million copies, but was critically well received. Alas, it would not receive a proper sequel and Nagoshi's team at Amusement Vision ultimately went on to become the studio to build the Yakuza series. This was, in my opinion, the last truly great F-Zero game, but it wasn't the final release. There was still more in store for the F-Zero franchise. In 2002, as F-Zero Maximum Velocity saw great success, particularly in Japan, Nintendo optioned the franchise to become a mixed media property in the hopes that many characters, designs, and the settings would lead to popular manga or animation. Under the supervision of Miyamoto himself, as well as Takuya Imamura, the company scouted Ashi Productions, now known as Production Read, to handle the introduction to a brand new world of F-Zero. Longtime screenwriter Sakai Akiyoshi was tasked to create an outline, while Ami Tomobuki was given the director's duty as she had previously proven herself very skilled at creating character-driven connections in her work. In F-Zero Falcon Densetsu, viewers would be introduced to the world of F-Zero via a new character of Ryu Suzaku, a policeman who suffers an accident and is put on ice, so to speak, until the year 2201, when he is suddenly revived. His revival is for the assistance to the mobile task force who are seeking out the evil syndicate Dark Million organization run by Black Shadow. Worst yet, Ryu's arch nemesis from his own time, Zoda, has been revived by Dark Million as well, reigniting their rivalry in the future. In the midst of all this turmoil and crime is the F-Zero Grand Prix, promising prize money that could either fund crime if it falls into the wrong hands or get rid of it should it land in the right hands as well as a mysterious bounty hunter by the name of Captain Falcon. 
Owing a lot of inspiration from popular action films and cyberpunk entities, Falcon Densetsu includes elements of mysticism and fantasy more akin to Star Wars, and the series was commissioned for a full 51 episode run on TV Tokyo in late 2003. While initial numbers were positive, the show failed to hold an audience due to slightly uneven pacing and confusing plot twists, so the expansion into other media such as manga and toys was ultimately scaled back. Miyamoto himself was reportedly quite unhappy with the lack of strong plot lines and scrapped numerous plans for future projects of a similar nature. In the US, the show was localized by four kids as F-Zero GP Legend and ran for 15 episodes focusing on that first story arc. For this version, names were changed, such as Ryu now being Rick Wheeler, as well as some additional content cuts to fit rating guidelines for children's television shows in the US during this time. Despite some popularity during the time, the series really never saw any home release, and despite some evidence that more episodes were produced for the English market, the remaining show never aired and faded from four kids rather quickly. Despite the attempts to create a franchise not really working out, a game tie-in was naturally inevitable. And yet again, on the Game Boy Advance, F-Zero would race on. F-Zero GP Legend on the Game Boy Advance landed in November 2003 in Japan. While ND Cube handled the development of Maximum Velocity, this brand new game would be handled by the relatively new company Suzak, headed by audio engineer and human entertainment employee Masahiro Yonezawa. Their work would follow closely in the vein of what ND Cube had done before them, but a few additions were made for GP Legend. The graphics engine and overall vehicle designs were overhauled to look closer to the original ship designs as seen in the anime ridding itself of the overall pre-rendered nature of the prior game. The new engine also allows for slightly smoother feeling performance, and generally the stage designs are a lot tighter than those found in Maximum Velocity. However, this seems to come at a price, as there is a pretty strict limit on how many vehicles you'll see on the screen at the same time. You'll often only find yourself feeling as if you're the only one on the track. A total of 29 characters are on display though, many of which make their debut from the anime in this game. Perhaps the biggest change is to the overall gameplay, which takes a lot more inspiration from F-Zero X and really leans heavily on the bump mechanic, rather than stark twists and turns requiring you to literally bump yourself into the correct path to make the turn without crashing headfirst into a wall. The boost mechanic is also back in a familiar fashion, allowing you to make use of boosts from the second lap as long as you got the energy left to do it. Another element which Suzak really leaned heavily into is the pinball mechanic, that sense of your car bouncing all over the place when you hit a wall. While it is manageable, it's an aspect that would come to plague Suzak's overall F-Zero direction, and it can really make a tiny mistake that in any previous game in the series wouldn't be much of a concern, completely destroy your progress. In regards to modes, GP Legend is actually one of the better overall packages though, and allows for a ton of variety. The Grand Prix mode, Time Trials, and Training modes, they're all here, but new to this game is also a Story mode, as well as the Zero Test. In Story mode, players take the journey through an abbreviated version of the anime, with dialogue and comic book panels in between stages, with each stage having different parameters in how to beat them. Throughout this mode, you'll unlock new characters with their own stories, and in turn, unlock them as well for use in other modes. Now in Zero Test, players are given various tests and challenges to solve across numerous classes and difficulties, with many of the later challenges really testing your skills and reflexes. It's pretty fun overall, and adds a lot of replay value to the game, even though by the latter stages of this mode, you might find yourself with skinned fingertips and hair loss. So it all sounds good on paper, right? And yeah, it's a pretty good game, especially in terms of overall content, but there's this feeling of fatigue to the formula with the flat track layouts and car designs that begins to set in. The music is better this time around, but nothing stands out considering the pedigree of the series. Visually speaking, the track parallax effect that was featured in Maximum Velocity has been dramatically improved to the point where there's even tracks that are transparent like this. It really does give the impression that you're driving across elevated tracks. As this was strangely an age of F-Zero and spades across consoles and handhelds, it's somewhat understandable 
perhaps, that something new was needed for F-Zero to really continue. In Japan, the game sold well enough to warrant some additional content via the e-reader peripheral. Many of these cards were produced, containing everything from new courses and racers. A fourth type of card, called Kadodas, were also produced, but only contain lore materials and cannot be scanned into e-readers. Some of these materials would make it to the western version of the game, though others have been relegated to this Japanese version via the cards, as the e-reader support was not extended outside of this region. Speaking of the western version, despite releasing in November 2003 in Japan, the US version would not see release until late September of 2004 to coincide with the cartoon on television thanks to four kids. The European version launched a few months prior in June. Outside of the lack of e-reader support, as well as some of that current content moved under the cartridge, there's also traces of some planned expert stages left in the game that can be unlocked, but not via normal means. GP Legend might be the best of the portable F-Zero games, but it strangely also signals something of an end as consumer interest, as well as developer interest for that matter, started to dwindle rapidly due to the repetitive nature of the franchise at this point and the cancellation of the anime did nothing to help the overall feeling that F-Zero was on a crash course. But one more title was on the horizon, one final go before all would be reset to zero. Only one month after the release of GP Legend in the United States, Japan already got the next installment in the handheld F-Zero series. F-Zero Climax continues the work started by Suzak and GP Legend and adds more stages, racers, and features into essentially the same framework. Graphics and sound have been further cleaned up and look quite good, while the stages retain the similar sharp bump turn design similar to GX and GP Legend. Overall, in terms of presentation, this is probably the best F-Zero has ever looked in 2D, and it looks fantastic on a proper backlit GBA screen. Climax is similarly feature-rich as its predecessor and has some very welcome additions. The biggest addition this time being the spin attack, similar into what was seen in F-Zero X and GX. The spin attack in Climax takes further inspiration from the anime unless you combine the attack with a boost for a signature move much like what was seen in the show. This adds a bit of a strategic layer to the game and enhances the combat, a welcome addition that deepens the overall gameplay. Unfortunately, the story mode is gone, as the anime saw no continuation, though the game retains that art style and characters from the anime. In its place, a new survival mode can be unlocked, which continues the work seen in Zero Test, and gives players a set of objectives to overcome in order to progress. Time attacks and Grand Prix are here as expected, and the Grand Prix sports over 50 courses total from the series history, as well as a few new stages. This sounds pretty impressive, but Grand Prix is probably where a lot of the issues related to Climax rear its head most. Mostly, the stages all feel kind of rehashed, and the concept of lifting such vast amount of courses over from previous year's iterations, with only so many new stages, leaves a bit of a sour taste in the mouth. But perhaps most of all, the difficulty is just all kinds of crazy. The game begins at a brisk pace before demanding you become a speed demon king, basically in an instant, and it really spikes out of nowhere without much of a learning curve for new players, or a sense of proper progression for longtime fans. It really just isn't that much fun, and the increased bounciness of cars hitting the wall makes it worse. The biggest addition though, and truly an awesome one at that, is the edit mode. For the first time, without the need of additional hardware, F-Zero Climax allows you to construct your very own stages with a surprisingly robust editor for the platform. Select your parts, enter them into the square grid, and voila, it's really quite simple and enjoyable. Not only can you create your own courses, but sharing them is a breeze as well. You can either save them to a cart or generate a password that you can share. Internally, 30 stages can be saved and enjoyed. So, F-Zero Climax. In some ways, it's a good send-off to the series with a good collection of original tracks, excellent edit mode, fun challenges, and a great presentation. But for many, the game felt very much like a rehash in 2004 and a little bit too much of the same. The insane difficulty spike didn't help its cause either, and despite the many classic courses or inspirations of them, 
The fact of the matter is, the action and gameplay doesn't have the same energy as the Super NES original. With the cancellation of the anime and lower than expected sales overall for the franchise then, F-Zero Climax would not only be the last F-Zero game to date, but it wouldn't even leave Japan as the game still remains exclusive to that territory. F-Zero Climax might be its name, but in some ways the fun ends too quick and leaves a lot to be desired. So what about F-Zero today? Well, it's been nearly two decades since the last proper game, and nothing suggests that anything new is on the horizon. Miyamoto himself has stated that in order for Nintendo to revisit the series, something new has to be added to the mix, in order to not simply repeat the same game they made before. On the other hand, GX producer Toshihiro Nagoshi has publicly stated that, given the chance, he'd like to work on the franchise again. So who knows if in the future we'll get either a new F-Zero game or at least a Captain Falcon cameo in Yakuza. But F-Zero is far from dead. Fans and even Nintendo themselves have kept the name and brand active throughout the years in hopes that their favorite racer will return. On Wii, Wii U, and even Switch, German developer Shinen provided a game very much modeled in the image of F-Zero with Fast, a futuristic racer with some truly beautiful visuals and impressive technology, considering both the hardware and size restrictions of the WiiWare service. They also updated it with Fast Racing Neo on the Wii U, which looks incredible, and Fast RMX on the Nintendo Switch. I've covered this one before on the channel, but it's a real gem if you haven't played it. It takes the speed and track design you might expect in an F-Zero game and adds in some new concepts, specifically Ikaruga-style color matching. When you pass through a blue boost zone, for instance, you want to toggle your ship to blue, whereas if you go through an orange section, you want to toggle it over to orange. This, combined with the normal boost and the crazy track layout, makes for some excellent game design. It's just a shame we haven't seen this released on a physical cartridge. At least the Wii U version did get a disc release in Europe. Nintendo, on the other hand, have mostly focused their F-Zero efforts in legacy showcases. Of course, the game itself has been made available on the Super NES Classic, as well as the various virtual console services. And also in games like Nintendo Land, where one of the attractions is Captain Falcon's Twister Race. This one involves using the motion control feature of the Wii U gamepad to sort of tilt your vehicle through a course. Sometimes you're simply taking on curves, other times you're dodging obstacles, but the goal is to make it through all the stages without running out of time. It's a pretty fun addition, even though it's really only designed for one player. F-Zero can also be found in WarioWare, but most likely fans would associate F-Zero's most famous character with the Smash Brothers series. Since the first iteration of Smash Brothers, Captain Falcon has been a part of the main cast, and his attack, the Falcon Puncher, might just be the most iconic attack in the series' history. Over the years, stages such as Mute City and assist trophies like Samurai Goro have been added in further showcasing its legacy. There was even some slight hope that we might be seeing a racing return of the series in 2014. Nintendo released a DLC pack for Mario Kart 8 containing two F-Zero stages, Mute City and Big Blue. The Blue Falcon was also made as a raceable kart. While we didn't get a new F-Zero game per se, it did at least give us the best version of the Big Blue music ever made. Just take a listen to this. Fans, on the other hand, have kept F-Zero alive with various projects. Numerous stage hacks for the Super NES version exist, such as Alternative Strike and The Revenge, adding in all new stages to the mix. In 2018, ROM hacker Grego created the F-Zero Final Hack, integrating all of the available stages from BS, F-Zero 1 and 2, as well as the car designs into the game in addition to Netplay via his alternate adapter. This is technically a very impressive hack, and hopefully with time, even more content can be added. But what about playing F-Zero on Sega's 16-bit machine? Well, you can, sort of. The impressive G-Zero hack shown here suggests that, in theory at least, something akin to F-Zero could be pulled off even without the Mode 7 feature of the Super NES, though it remains to be seen just how much fun that would actually be. 
There's also Hue Zero from Chris Covell that was released for the PC Engine. This also bears a similarity to the Super NES original, though it uses a very different method for simulating the ground. Neither of these homebrew efforts are especially complete, but they're neat to see and shows that something similar to F-Zero could have been pulled off on the hardware. And what about today? What's the best way to appreciate F-Zero? Well, naturally, you can enjoy the Super NES original in various ways, officially from Nintendo, and it remains a fun classic to this day. Using emulators such as BeastNest HD, it's even possible to play the game in high resolution and widescreen. Though the widescreen support is spotty, as unlike, say, the Super Mario World hack, it hasn't been adjusted to fit that. As a result, vehicles are not drawn outside of the 4x3 area. F-Zero X then still has the performance going for it, so if you have a CRT, four controllers, and three retro-friendly friends, a split-screen session can never go wrong. But perhaps the most impressive way to enjoy any F-Zero today is F-Zero GX, with the help of some emulation enhancements. The GameCube emulator Dolphin I mentioned earlier is a perfect partner for enjoying this game. This allows for dramatically higher rendering resolutions and the elimination of other rendering issues associated with GameCube, such as dithering or low quality texture filtering. The limitations are more obvious in 2021, but in reality, the game scales up very well to high resolutions. GX offers a super clean design that feels timeless. You might bump into some slight shader compilation stutter, depending on your configuration, and I've heard reports that the desert track is more demanding on hardware, but my experience has been excellent. I played it using an Xbox One pad, but it would probably be even better with a USB-capable GameCube controller. So while Nintendo has relegated the series primarily to guest appearances, the community has kept F-Zero alive. I hope you've enjoyed this journey through the world of F-Zero then, from its humble beginnings in the Super Famicom as a launch game, to the fusion between Nintendo and its once rival Sega. F-Zero made its mark in the racing world. In addition to everything else that's been said, it's also important to note that F-Zero is a series which has never delivered a frame rate less than 60 frames per second. It's always been fast, it's always been fluid, and it's all about blistering speeds. F-Zero is almost a perfect series. Every entry brings something to the table, and all of them hold up, even those handheld games. Perhaps someday, in the far off future then, the stars will align, and once again, F-Zero will make its triumphant return.